Hey, I'm Kat, mom of three and founder of Ritual, the company setting a new standard in the supplement industry. When I was pregnant, I remember staring at my prenatal vitamins and thinking, what's in this stuff? All I found were vitamins high in heavy metals and lacking in the very essential nutrients we need. So we scoured the world for the best quality ingredients, backed by clinical studies, third-party tested, and Ritual's essential prenatal was born. Join our family of skeptics with 40% off your first month when you visit ritual.com slash podcast. This is Make It Plain. M.I.P. With Mark Thompson. Make It Plain. Get Woke. Ladies and gentlemen, it's that most wonderful time of the week once again. Thursday Coast is with you once again on Make It Plain. And we're always happy to have with us the founder of Daily Coast and the founder of Civics with a Q. Uh, we express our deepest condolences to him as he is a mourning uh, immensely over the death of uh, Rush Limbaugh. So we're going to give him a minute to kind of close himself. Close himself. <laughs> <laughs> and share. I was, I was literally on another Zoom, Marcos, when the news broke. And somebody said, well, Rush Limbaugh died. And everybody was struggling not to say something unkind. Like everybody was like, my mother told me not to say something ugly. When someone died. But <laughs> yeah, was, I mean, seriously. If there was ever a person where anybody had to catch themselves, it, it was this one. And, and well, I want to hear your thoughts, but I, I think we have to acknowledge that the, the disinformation the proliferation of disinformation that we're experiencing in this country today uh, really got going, had its genesis in the Rush Limbaugh era. Yeah, he was the pioneer and uh, uh, of manipulating people's ignorances and then pretending that it was common sense uh, and uh, and then profiting from it. I mean, he, he's the one that showed Rupert Murdoch the, the model for Fox News. And uh, he made it okay to be openly racist again. I mean, he started with with dog whistles, and just like by the end of it, you know, he was overtly racist. So yeah, with 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 Rush, I mean, I have, I have nothing kind to say about him. He was an asshole to everybody around him that wasn't a white conservative male, and uh, he wasn't kind when other people died, right? So I mean, he reaps what he sows, I guess. Um, and I think it's somewhat fitting, though, the white supremacist that he was, that we, the Congress or the House Judiciary held a reparations hearing for H.R. 40 on the day he died. <laughs> so I think that's kind of, you know, a little bit of poetic justice, you know. No, the, maybe a little divine intervention there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, <laughs> uh, his black counterparts, Larry Old and Herschel Walker, uh, testified, uh, and and made fools out of themselves. Slavery was okay. We weren't really. Herschel Walker said we weren't really taken from Africa. Oh, interesting interpretation of history. <laughs> wow. These are. I guess these are those alternative facts that. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That the Trump people like to talk about. And and so much once again when you trot those kind of they were Republican witnesses for the Republican side of course. Uh, uh, so much for. Um, and Larry Elder, by the way, said that uh, uh, Africa was as responsible for the slave trade as American Europe. Um, but that further confirms that there's no hope, no agenda for, for that party to um, get itself together, change its approach. I mean, you still trotting people like that out. It was an extreme embarrassment um, during Black History Month. So. Yeah. yeah, I I I mean it's it's actually kind of fascinating. It sort of bleeds a little bit into the whole impeachment vote where Republicans really had a chance here to make a clean break with somebody who had really tanked the Republican Party and its brand. Uh Trump was only the sec third president in a hundred years to lose re-election. I mean, this is, doesn't happen very often. He lost in the House, he lost in the Senate, 
He lost some college uh, swing voters in the suburbs. He lost the suburbs in general. I mean, he's somebody that's really damaged the party. And the only thing that he brought them, and he brought more of them for sure, he brought them old white rural voters. And yeah, there's a lot more of them that weren't voting than than any of us, you know, thought. And it's horrifying to know that there's this whole, whole hidden deplorable contingent out in America. But the fact is that's a dying demographic, and every demographic that's growing is uh, is is voted strongly and heavily for the Democrats. And and so there's there's. I mean, if I was a Dem- if I was a Republican and I didn't want reparations, I mean, I, I could think of many ways to push back without being raging, you know, raging racist about it. But apparently, they 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 have one speed at this point, <laughs> right. and and you know, there's a couple, there's the Adam Kitzinger and nobody else. I mean, <laughs> it's right. a, and but the bulk of the party, it's it's completely gone off the deep end, and, and they're just a party of resentment and hatred and anger, and and God forbid, um, you know, even the discussion of, of reparations be considered from the same crowd that's crying about being discriminated against because they're conservative, right? I mean, you know, for a crowd that likes to talk about other people being snowflakes and being triggered, they are the most sensitive. Uh, just whiny people in politics. It's kind of amazing. And, 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 you know, it, their arguments, quite frankly, in the reparations hearing was so ridiculous, um, that it probably helped that there was not a credible argument. What, so what were get, the arguments? I mean, well, just what I was saying, just, just a, a, a misinterpretation. Oh. Here, oh. This, oh, and, and here's the thing that they always fall back on. You probably can guess this. They're still in on that same sheet of music they've been on for the past 40 years. The Democrats, the Democrat Party exploits African-Americans. The Democrat Party is trying to win African-Americans over with welfare and a handout. They, they don't even realize reparations is different from public assistance. So they just they can't do. And, and then they start talking about how the Republican Party was the party that freed the slaves. So they're just, you know, and, 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 and who hasn't heard that argument over and over? So they didn't even come prepared with a credible argument. You know what that argument is, Mark? And you know this, I don't need to tell you this. That's, that's not an argument meant to convince black people that Republicans are there for them. That's an argument to make white racists feel okay about themselves. And maybe not even a white racist, but, but maybe those suburban college educated voters that they're leaving to, to think, well, you're not, you know, we're not, we can't be the party of the racists if we're the party that, you know, they blink in. But nobody buys that anymore. And that ship sailed. And you can see that just in, in vote to- turnout, uh, vote uh, results, that that those sort of smart, college-educated white people are moving over to the Democrats. Uh, I mean, the obvious argument, Mark, is we can't afford it. The deficits, blah, 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 deficit, deficit, deficit. I mean, that's the the to me, the obvious argument, or maybe even say public assistance is a form of reparations. Did they try that one? No, they, they didn't even try that. Okay, so even that, you know, like what is welfare? Welfare is a form of reparation. They could come up with some BS arguments like that, but instead, they're, <laughs> instead of Africa is just as culpable. <laughs> come on. Yeah. They're not even trying. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. So uh, we we will see uh, where that goes. In the meantime, um, help me understand why, um, you know, after Trump has been deplatformed, it, when he uh, lashed out at Mitch McConnell, the, the media just kind of picked it up as if it was still their responsibility to report on what he does. I was kind of disappointed in that. You know, um, um I'm a little more sympathetic for that. I mean, there's okay. there's a battle for the for the for control of the Republican Party, and Donald Trump is clearly the dominant factor. Uh, you have most of the Republican Party sort of still bending the knee towards him, and so the fact that he can't. I mean, to me, the deep platforming means he just can't speak directly to people using his his. He's got to go through filters. And um, so to me, that, that that's less 
I, I want to say ignore the guy, but he is the ex-president and he does control a whole, you know, one of the two parties. I think it's kind of hard to ignore it. I think what's, what's, what I'd like to see is, is a continued effort on, on, uh, on fact checking and in holding him accountable for the truth. And I got to say, you know, if we want to go back to Rush Limbaugh's um, death, I wasn't very encouraged because most of the stuff I saw in the media was talking about his, his uh, none of it called him out for being a liar, for calling it being a racist. Like they're still afraid to just state the obvious. I mean, this is, shouldn't be controversial. He was overtly a liar. It's documented, you know, reams of it. You don't have to, it's not an opinion. Right. He was a liar, but instead he was he was controversial. He was what was the other word they used? He was he was uh, oh there's a word that they used to uh, somebody who basically is a Rush Limbaugh. I, I can't think of it now, but uh, um, yeah, it was just you know how controversial he was. I mean, just say it, just say it. But they can't, they can't. The media's still afraid to call a liar a liar. That's the that's the bigger problem. But you know. He put out a statement. Fact is, he's st- putting out a statement takes a lot more work than him sending out 180 tweets. And that's what he would rather be doing. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. he's talking to Fox. I mean, Fox is <laughs> giving him a platform. Yeah. So no. interesting to me. He's not going to Newsmax to do his phone or he's not going to OAN- OANN. So I'm not sure uh, his, his, he's, he knows damn well he can't quit Fox. Right, right. What now that we saw what happened with impeachment vote? But first, let, let's start with our side. Do you have a sense of what happened? One minute we were looking at witnesses, the next minute we weren't. You know, nobody knows. By all indications, Senator Chris Coons wanted to go on freaking vacation. He wanted he wanted to be home by Valentine's Day, and so you know unless there's a story there that we don't know like maybe joe biden was trying to like you know sending a signal saying let's get the stimulus package passed and you know this isn't helping us maybe yeah. there's some of that but i've seen zero evidence of that i don't even think anybody's i mean that would be the only thing because it was chris coons that killed it and he's never been a particularly good senator i mean delaware is you know delaware is credit card central right so you have historically you just have a bunch of they're democrats yeah but they're all beholden to the credit card industry and that's banking and wall street so they've never been great but to me um deciding to end the trial so you can go home on vacation is just as much a dereliction of democracy as the republicans who refuse to out of fear it's unconscionable so if there's coons and it's Delaware. He probably did do that at, at Joe's behest. You know, there's no evidence of it. I mean, nobody, nobody's even, I've seen no reporting that suggests that that's what happened, that it came from Joe Biden. Joe Biden's been very good from the beginning, uh, both publicly and in blind quotes as saying like, <laughs> yeah, it's just, this is up to Congress. It's, I have nothing to do with this. And, um, uh, so um, the fact that Coons is from Delaware and that he is, I mean, we know that he's close to Biden. It could have been Coons thinking, you know what, I'm just going to help my pal out. You know, it could have come from him basically saying we have, you know, we have to get this COVID bill. We, we want to get voting reform through. We want to do something on climate. Now, there's, there's a pretty, on immigration, there's a really aggressive agenda. Of course, um, None of that's going to happen without a filibuster after after the stimulus, because uh, you can only do that once. It's you can't keep going back to it time and time again in a in a session. It's a limited number of times you can use it. So once you're that, you know you're now after the 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 COVID bill, we're back to filibustering everything being filibuster. But uh, so maybe he thought he was helping, but all the reports are his argument was he wanted to be home by by Valentine's Day. So if he was trying to help somebody out, they're selling it really poorly. I, I think he I, I'm almost willing to just trust those news reporters as just at face value. He just didn't want to deal with it. How is this going to impact Republicans, especially with the midterms coming up? I mean, they they literally didn't do justice. They went insane. They flaked out. Mitch McConnell, a total con- walk in contradiction. 
he votes one way and then speaks another. What what does that do to them? Yeah, I, I don't know what McConnell was doing. It's you 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 either rip that bandaid off and go, you know, and you vote to convict or or you don't. Uh he pissed everybody off. I mean, he didn't the the you know the reason he was sort of wobbly on impeachment on, on conviction, I'm sorry. Uh, or two reasons, really. One is I, I think he just l- pretty much hates Donald Trump. I mean, it's clear that he thought Donald Trump was an idiot and he cost him his his speak, uh, his uh, majority leader. So there's that, of course. But I think um, that sort of was offset by the fact that McConnell hates Republic- hates Democrats even more. And I don't think he was really eager to give Democrats a victory. That said, you had corporate PACs that are pulling their funding from the Republican Party. And they were sending a message basically that as long as the Republican Party is is tied to this white supremacist Trump um, side of things, that they weren't gonna they weren't gonna donate to Republicans anymore. And I I always assumed that that was his big his big um, sort of consideration. And I think we even talked about it last week when we were we were you know discussing whether it was going to happen or not. I said the only thing that might get Republicans to vote to convict is if they decide uh, that this money isn't coming back. Like maybe they, maybe some of these corporate PACs will quietly start donating again, you know, in three, four months when they think nobody's paying attention. But a lot of them, you know, Microsoft already said they're done for the, for the cycle, right? So there's a lot of money that Republicans have now sort of left on the table and they don't have a small dollar donor base like we do thanks to Act Blue. So they are wholly dependent on those corporate dollars. Uh, then you have... McConnell, after pissing off his main source of funding, then he pisses off Donald Trump <laughs> you know, by giving that speech about how Donald Trump should be prosecuted and convicted. So he tried to thread a needle, but not only, you know, it, it was the most spectacular backfire of a thread the needle that I think that I've ever seen. So, so now you have all the Trump people acting the same way they did in a run up to the Georgia special election, right? Republican party sellouts. Why should we help the Republicans? Screw Mitch McConnell. It's all rigged anyway. And so it really opens up a possibility here that, that our side ends up being the more engaged again and more, uh, more likely to vote. Uh, But I, I will say this, Mark, I think the bigger factor may even be that the child credit. We talked about that last week. I think that that monthly check, if 2022 becomes a question of whether you keep getting a monthly check or you don't get a monthly check for for families, I I think that's a tough choice for even like Q people. I mean, who wants to give up their sweet government check? Yeah. And yeah, you, you're right. Um, that issue of uh, the check uh, is important. So so but on McConnell, though. You, I guess you then are being scriptural and saying, Marcos, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for Mitch McConnell to thread one. Is that? I, apparently. I mean, maybe there was a <laughs> there was a better way to do it. But um, <laughs> like, I, I can't believe I just I mean, and then he tried to hide under it. Oh, it's a constitutional issue. You, you think it two seconds that. If it was Hillary Clinton we were talking about who had done everything Trump did, that he would be like, I'm not going to vote to convict because of the Constitution. Like, come on. Like, who are you kidding? Just, just if you're going to give that speech, go ahead and convict. Ain't nobody, what, the Supreme Court's going to invalidate it? Okay, let the Supreme Court invalidate it. I mean, that was so right. dumb. Right. It was so dumb. Um, Joe Biden, child tax credit. He's also it, it, some of the polls are saying that his numbers are through the roof approval because even those who don't like him seem to appreciate him trying to get vaccines, trying to get people their stimulus check or which Marcus, we have to prove we're still young and say stimmy. Don't say oh. stimmy, say stimmy. That's what you say. Yeah, I'm not even going to pretend. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surrendering. Yeah. Um, so so trying to get people their stimmies and um, trying to do the $15 minimum wage. I mean, his, his numbers, his approval numbers are, are pretty good for any president at this stage of his presidency. Yeah. And, and I, I would even say, I mean, they're not through the roof in a historical sense. Like, you know, you had 
George Bush at 90% after 9-11. Um, there, there's, um, I mean, Obama, after he was first elected, was in the 80s, I think, uh, before Fox News laid in on him. So there, there's, I mean, there's been higher, but given how polarized we are as a, as a nation, it should be, it should be 50%. Like he should be locked in at 50% because that's what the nation is. And he's not, you know, I've, I've seen him in the mid to high fifties. Um, so he is doing pretty well. And, and I will say this, his, his big, the biggest change we've seen. And I think it just sets the entire tone for the Biden presidency is that he's not defining bipartisanship by getting Mitch McConnell to agree with him. That was, that will always be Barack Obama's cardinal sin is, is this desperation to get Republican votes. Uh, Biden's going like, it's popular with America. That's bipartisanship. And once you start looking at what's popular with Americans, everything is possible. Immigration reform is hugely popular with Americans, right? Uh, action on climate change is popular with Americans. Um, civil rights, uh, justice reform, voting rights reform, all those things are incredibly popular with Americans. And so once you get away from this mindset that popularity is defined by Mitch McConnell and his caucus, and it's actually defined by the broader public, then it makes, you know, it suddenly makes all these things possible. And this should follow, but I mean, it should be obvious, but it wasn't before. If you do what's popular, it makes you popular. <laughs> it's just, this is what I could never understand why Democrats were so desperate for, for Republican, you know, congressional Republican support. And when Republicans were just basically obfuscating and delaying and, and, and just blocking legislation. And then they, then they would run and say Democrats didn't do anything. So do what's popular and then you become popular and then people want to vote for you. I mean, this is, this is not rocket science and it's, Kind of surprised, I got to say, Mark, that I wouldn't have expected Joe Biden to be the person to really, the first person to implement that. Of course not, because he was always running around saying, oh, yeah. I've been up there on. He was, yeah. he was a creature of that institution. Totally. And, and you know, we, we talked about that, whether he was going to go up there and do all that, all these things that Barack Obama did. Yeah. But, but, but I can remember a couple of occasions, even when he was vice president under Obama, where they were in those meetings. Remember when he called everybody, Obama called everybody to the White House, talked about the Affordable Care Act, and he was trying to, you know, keep everybody in the table, and Joe, John McCain was there. And at one point, Biden just goes off, and Obama pulled him back, said, no, no, Joe, let's, let's try, to work, <laughs> try to work this out. Um, so, you know, maybe, maybe the smoke-filled rooms Joe Biden was in uh, were not as... Um, uh, uh, benign as we thought. Um, and so, no, this is a good thing. Um, I, you know, I, I think too, you know, even when you allude to how Fox tore into Obama, see, that was again, part of the problem in the campaign. Joe was a white dude. So it, you, 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 it's hard to find something on him that sticks, you know, and, and I think that they're going to have a problem with that. And, and of course, I'm glad to hear that he's not going to be kissing up to McConnell. But you mentioned the filibuster. What what's what what is the next step? Yeah, just, just get rid of. It. There, there's so little on Joe Biden. They have nothing on him that that Tucker Carlson last night was claiming that that his and Joe Biden's marriage was a fiction drawn up by consultants. <laughs> this thirty year long game, I guess. <laughs> this long con. I mean, they got nothing, right? But if it was Warren, you know, they would be harping on, you know, they would find all sorts of uh, made up uh, or Harris, right? They they would find things to make up. And it's amazing. You're right. Like the white guy, it's it's a lot an older white guy too. And straight, old, straight white guy. They, they, they got nothing. They're flailing right now. But uh, the, the filibuster, it's, it's, the filibuster is going to come down to a key piece of legislation, and I'm suspecting it's going to be HR1, the, the Voting Rights Act, which actually may even have D.C. statehood wrapped up into it. And 
mansion is is the big roadblock and you know people talk about cinema and they talk about feinstein but neither of those two are going to be the deciding vote against a key piece of legislation mansion historically has been no has had no problem being the deciding vote and sticking it to to the liberals i i'm actually hopeful for two reasons one is that mansion specifically said that he's not going to be the reason that joe biden fails and he had been adamant that 1.9 trillion was too high and that fifty thousand and that seventy five thousand dollars for the stimulus check was too high, and he backed down on both of those things. I mean, it it, it seems pretty clear that Joe Biden sort of you know pulled him aside, and maybe they even come up with a deal. Maybe Manchin's got some goodies to deliver back home, but whatever the reason is, he backed off on those threats, and that's a good thing. So that shows you that he's willing to to back off on his very sort of clear stances. Now, he's been very clear that he's not going to do the filibuster, but here's the second thing is that, so HR1 is basically a, a civil rights legislation, right? It's making it, you know, it's protecting everybody's right to choose. The filibuster really came into its own as a tool, a Jim Crow tool, as a way to stop civil rights legislation. Is Joe Manchin really going to stop a piece of civil rights legislation using a racist procedural tool? And I mean, he might, <laughs> you know, it's, probably, it's probably not a bad bet to say he will. Right. But I actually think that it's going to, it puts him in a really, really difficult position. And I think I've mentioned this before on the show, Mark, is that uh, Manchin has been sounding suspiciously like a Democrat lately, which leads me to believe that he actually, he may not be running for reelection I and mean, he's got four years, the state, you know, Trump won it by 40 points. He barely won two years ago. He may be thinking like, I'm on borrowed time, so I don't have to try to pretend to be a Republican anymore. And he's still who he is. He's still a conservative Democrat, but that doesn't mean he's an anti-voting rights Democrat. Is he really going to stand in the way? And this really came through when, when he said he was totally open on statehood for D.C. and Puerto Rico, which, I mean, blew my mind. I mean, it's it's that's like a gimme. Uh, and he's not going to be, if he was a guy who voted to give statehood to DC, he's not getting reelected in West Virginia. And he probably knows it. And I, I'm getting the sense that he probably doesn't care anymore. Do, do, well, unless the West Virginians know and understand what statehood is for DC. <laughs> Does that mean, I should, I'm sorry, let me just apologize. I know people are say, they, they, they will know that it's black people, more black people voting. And, and they'll also know it's the possibility of a, of a permanent Senate majority because that's, that's two other senators. Yeah. Uh, two other democratic senators. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, th there's that. You think Puerto Rico could be in that bill too? No, I don't think Puerto Rico is going to be in that bill. Okay. Puerto Rico is more complicated and because there's some, there's colonial issues, there's self-determination issues. Uh, they had a, they had a, um, a referendum, but it was non-binding. And, you know, have, those statehood referendums are always boycotted by one side or the other. I mean, there has to be, I think for DC statehood, you actually have to have a binding real referendum with the real consequences so that people actually have a choice. It's not just, you know, it's just, it's just having an opinion. There's a difference between having an opinion and really deciding what the fate of your, 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 island is going to be so i would love to see dc statehood in there i just think it, it starts wrapping into some some really complicated politics and it brings up some really ugly colonial um undertones that might need to be dealt on our own and and puerto rico in the past i don't know about the most recent referendum but r referenda in the past always kind of undermined themselves because there were three choices status yeah. quo independence of statehood and the majority, when well, you got three choices, the majority always votes for the two, independent or statehood, and, and nobody wins. So I don't know what the last referendum said. But you the, the last one, it was it was statehood won fairly, fairly okay. comfortably. But the um, the independence crowd boycotted it because and I think they boycotted it because they thought, saw they were going to lose. And <laughs> then, uh, then they can say, yeah, they lost because we boycotted it. So it's not even I, mean, I actually think statehood would probably pass, but I think it's a very divisive issue. And, uh, and I just think it needs a certain level of sensitivity um, 
that I haven't seen it, you know, really put on the issue just yet. And so uh, at this point, I just, let's get DC. Like they're the ones that are really, you know, let's, let's get statehood for DC if we can. Let's guarantee people's right to vote. Let's get that into a piece of legislation. And, uh, and then we can address statehood for, um, for Puerto Rico. Um, indeed. Um, and by the way, last Sunday, I know to many was Valentine's Day, but it was also Frederick Douglass's birthday. And once D.C. becomes the 51st state, it will no longer be known as the District of Columbia. It will be named after Frederick Douglass. It will be known as the Douglass Commonwealth. Gives me chills, Mark. Gives me chills. It's amazing. The first time I saw that, I had tears. I was like, whoever whoever came up with that, they nailed that. How perfect. Yeah, yeah, no question about it. So we look forward to that. Folks, check out The Brief, the new podcast uh, with Marcos. And uh, it's available wherever you get your podcasts. Be sure to check it out. Also, as always, uh, read Daily Coast. Check out Civics with a Q uh, as well and all the great information research. By the way, Civics was involved last year in the reparations poll uh, where yes. we saw the number of people who, who were interested and supportive of reparations um, was going up. Uh, yes. To our knowledge, it has not gone down. So we will see uh, what happens with this uh, legislation. The companion bill has been reintroduced in the Senate as well. So there's H.R. 40 in the House, S. 40 in the Senate. Cory Booker, the primary sponsor. Contact, please, ma'am, please, sir, your senators and your representatives and ask them to become co-sponsors of H.R. 40 in the House and S. 40 in the Senate. Awesome. Indeed. Thank and you. I'm glad it's Cory Booker doing that, too. He's, he's not particularly a strident leftist either. He's a, he's a middle of the road Democrat. So he's a good vehicle for that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's yeah, it's good, and and we're glad that he's on board. And a yep. hundred, a hundred, right now, I think at this hour, it's a hundred sixty-five co-sponsors in the house. Sweet, you know, and and we've not had that many. That's significant. So you're moving toward that that magic number after the hearing, possibly a markup, and then and then possibly a vote, and then if the Senate holds out, then you know the question then becomes whether or not Joe Biden will do establish that because it would only the legislation would just establish a commission a lot of people yeah right legislation is not to start issuing money the legis yeah. the legislation would establish a commission to see what forms yeah like we were just talking about the stimmy you give you give all black people five thousand dollars in this economy that's gone tomorrow everybody's behind broke covid covid economy so this is a, not just about just some individual check or a few thousand dollars this is about um, establishing real investment, everything the white folks got from the Homestead Act to the Fair Housing to the GI Bill. Folks, wealth in America is based on land and home ownership. Yeah. And the white middle class just didn't wake up one morning and it was a middle class. You, you had to get the homesteading and you had to get the GI Bill. Dick Gregory used to say that your whiteness is not determined by the color of your skin, but by the amount of money in your bank account. <laughs> and, and so wealth is relative. So we talk about black wealth versus white. Wealth. Most white wealth is in the family homes. Yeah. And what has been handed down. And that's, I mean, that works. But mm -hmm. African Americans didn't get that opportunity in many ways still don't. So yeah. the question then becomes, will Biden sign the commission? And frankly, in some of the conversations with Biden, um, you know, well, you know, we want to do our own thing. We want to do an equity commission. But but reparations is equity. You know, it's like reparations is still a scary word like defund. Reparations was like defund before defund was defund. Um, but it was the African-American electorate that got Joe Biden in office, that got Ossoff and uh, Warnock in. So people saying, hey, you know, you got to you got to do this. And stop being so scared of a commission that would study what it is and how to implement. And, and again, it's, it's good politics. I mean, you want to show people that their vote actually leads to something tangible, do stuff for them. So uh, yeah, definitely hope it happens. And Biden could, I mean, imagine you just go down in history. It, I mean, it, as one of the greatest presidents ever to actually uh, do that, I had a guest on who, who did a book on Thaddeus Stevens, uh, who's portrayed in the Lincoln movie. 
Thaddeus Stevens was in favor of reparations back in the day. Mm. They were debating the 14th and 15th. He wanted to seize the land from uh. some of the southern landowners and give it to those of us who were freed. All right. Yeah. And of course, that didn't come to fruition. Years later, when an organiz- a, a great black organization by the name of Republic of New Africa made the same argument, give us the southern states, J. Edgar Hoover snatched them up under COINTELPRO, put them in prison. And some of those brothers are still in prison today for advocating what Thaddeus Stevens called for. So again, those of you, Marcos, I don't know if you've seen the, the big movie Judas and the Black Messiah yet. No, I haven't. Um, but, you, but you should. But I'm saying everyone, that movie is about COINTELPRO. And so we must look at things from a reparational lens. Some of the people depicted in that movie are, they killed Fred Hampton, but some people got locked up and they're still in prison today. That's what reparations is about because all of these things still have had an impact um, on the African-American. Yeah, undoubtedly. On. So yeah. that, that's that's why we're making this. And the hearing was great. You all should go back and watch it if you hadn't had an opportunity. The UN, man, even the, the U, United Nations Special Repertoire if I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, for human rights, testified at a House Judiciary hearing um, as to what reparations is and what it ought to be and why the U.S. needs it. Japanese Americans have gotten it. Others have gotten it. African Americans deserve it as well. So we appreciate everyone. Contact your senator. Contact your representative. Thursday Coast. Don't forget, check out the brief as well. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Everybody, please wear your masks. Indeed, please please wear your mask. Thanks for getting woke and listening to Make It Plain. Please remember to listen, like, subscribe, and wherever you get your podcasts, please give the show a five-star rating. And please do spread the word. Let's all continue to pray for each other during this pandemic and this police-demic. If all hearts and minds are clear, it has been Made Plain. Hey, I'm Kat, mom of three and founder of Ritual, the company setting a new standard in the supplement industry. When I was pregnant with my first daughter, I remember staring at my prenatal vitamins and thinking, what's in this stuff? All I found were vitamins high in heavy metals, synthetic colorants, and lacking in the very essential nutrients we need. I believe women deserve to know what they are putting in their bodies and why. So at four months pregnant, I quit my job to reinvent the prenatal vitamin. We scoured the world for the best quality ingredients, backed by clinical studies and third-party tested for heavy metals and microbes. And this year, we were awarded the Purity Award from the Clean Label Project, the supplement safety certification that tests for 200 harmful chemicals and toxins. With Ritual, you'll know where your ingredients come from and why we use them. Join our family of skeptics with 40% off your first month when you visit ritual.com slash podcast.